We come to uh, a very short little passage in the sixth chapter of Luke. If you're visiting with us today, we've been going through the Gospel of Luke, pretty much verse by verse, thought unit by thought unit, and uh, we plan to continue on that path for a while. And so if, um, if you have your Bibles with you, turn to the sixth chapter of Luke, and uh, if you don't, we'll throw the words on the screen, but we're in verses 12 through 16. And I would just ask that you stand as we read God's word together. One of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray, and he spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, whom he also designated apostles. Simon, whom he named Peter, his brother Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon, who was called the Zealot, Judas, son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. This is the word of the Lord. Please have a seat. Now any time that you engage with the Bible, if you're opening the Bible to read a certain text, the text always takes on its meaning by understanding the context of what came before it. And for those of us who have been kind of marching through the Gospel of Luke, uh, this will be familiar. Those visiting with us today, you need to understand this context. You see, Ever since his baptism, Jesus and his time of temptation in the desert, Jesus has been teaching in the synagogues within the region of Galilee. And we know what he was teaching. It's found uh, in in a passage where he taught in his hometown. And this is the message that the long awaited Messiah has arrived, that the prophecy, the messianic prophecies of Isaiah have been fulfilled. There is now good news for the poor, freedom for the prisoner, Recovery of sight for the blind, uh, release for the oppressed, and the full expression of God's favor all wrapped up in this one person named Jesus Christ. And Jesus has not only preached and talked about this good news, he has also validated this good news with power. He has demonstrated authority over the physical world and healing. He's demonstrated authority over the spirit's world and casting out demons, and he has ex- he's also established and exercised authority to forgive sins. And true today, as it was then, Jesus, therefore, has drawn a good bit of attention. He cannot be ignored. And consequently, multitudes of people have begun to follow Jesus wherever he goes. Now, some of those people that are following him, we have, we have learned, were specifically called to follow. That was true in, in the case of Peter, James, John, and Levi, who's also known as Matthew. Many, many people followed him because they knew that this man had a reputation for healing, and they were sick or in pain, and they were desperate for a touch or, or a, 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 an experience of his power that would bring transformation in their lives. There is also another group of people that we've learned who have begun to follow Jesus, and these are his critics. These are powerful religious leaders within that first century context who are very skeptical of who Jesus is. And this group of people have been following along, seeing if they can catch Jesus in some blatant form of sin or heresy. They are looking, they have been looking for some way to discredit him. But last week we saw that a a time came about on a Sabbath in a synagogue where there was a showdown. The Pharisees were eager to catch Jesus breaking the Sabbath restrictions. And they, they were watching him as he encountered a man who had a withered right hand. They knew that if Jesus was actually breaking the law, if he was in fact a sinner, that when he attempted to heal this man on the Sabbath in the synagogue, that he would fail. He would be exposed. But instead, when Jesus told that man to extend out his hand, his hand was perfectly healed, which validated Jesus Everyone there knew that Jesus had authority over the Sabbath. Jesus had an authority, a superlative power and wisdom and mercy that trumped his critics. And we read at the end of that thought unit in verse 11 of chapter 6 that they, his critics, the Pharisees and the scribes, were furious and began to discuss with one another what they might do to Jesus. Remember, it's on this occasion that his critics go from being those who are skeptical who want to discredit Jesus to becoming full-fledged enemies who want to kill Jesus. And that is the context that leads into this uh, this short thought unit 
in verses 12 through 16. Jesus now recognizes that the ruling influencers of his day, of his society and his culture, want him dead. Now, I don't care who you are, but knowing that powerful people are conspiring to kill you will cause you to lose sleep. And here we see that Jesus goes to the mountain to pray, and he spends all night in prayer to the Father. Now, I want to stop there for a minute because some of you might be like me, and I'll, I'll just, I'm kind of a weird person, but you know, sometimes if I'm out cutting grass or I'm doing some mundane task, I'll begin to think of, of questions like, why did Jesus have to pray to God? I thought Jesus was God. Is Jesus praying to himself? Does anybody ever think, see, you don't think those things, but you know, may, maybe, maybe some of us do. We get confused about things like Jesus praying to the Father. And, and we, we don't understand why Jesus would really need to pray because we think of him as God walking around on earth, omniscient, all-knowing, uh, omnipresent, all those things. So in case you're asking questions like this and you get into a little circle, a circular loop, and you can't get yourself out of it, I just want to touch on this for just a minute. Remember, first of all, that Jesus is fully human. He is the Son of God, but to some degree, Jesus is not unlike Adam, who is also referred to as the son of God in the, uh, in the genealogy there in Luke. In other words, his earthly body is created. He is born into the world as a baby. He grows up, he sweats, he eats, breathes, feels human, everything, all, all the pain, all of that, he, he takes on. Jesus is the son of God in spirit, but Jesus has taken on our human form. In other words, he's taken on our skin, our nature, our language, and our limitations. And where do we know that to be true? We see it all throughout the gospel, but Paul captures it beautifully in Philippians 2 when he says, Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being formed, uh, sorry, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient. That's a very powerful little paragraph that really sums up this mystery of the humanness of Jesus as it relates to his relationship with the Father and the divinity of his own spirit. And so Jesus has denied himself. He's made himself nothing. He's taken on the full human experience and expression with one exception. And that is that Jesus, because he is conceived by the Holy Spirit, is not tainted by the fallen blood of Adam. Jesus is fully human, but he's not a fallen human. And that really is the quintessential difference between Jesus and us. In every respect, we are very much exactly the same as Jesus, although we are fallen humans, and he was not. He had the option to sin, he had the temptation to sin, but he was not condemned or destined to sin as we are who have the fallen blood of Adam within us. Now, when Jesus goes about his day-to-day existence as a human being, we can assume it was not terribly unlike our own. In other words, you know, you get up, you eat, you go to work, you eat, you play, you eat, (laughs) you eat, you know, and then you go to bed and you get up and you do the same thing over again. Jesus understood the pattern of human existence. But Jesus understood that to live successfully as a human is not to live for oneself, but to live for the one who created us. So Jesus, what? He prays. He prays a lot. He prays to discern the will of his Father, and then the text tells us that he is obedient to the Father, even unto death. If you're curious to know what kinds of things Jesus prayed about, you can go to the 17th chapter of John and read that. The whole chapter is a prayer between Jesus and the Father. Jesus prays publicly at his baptism. He prays publicly before the raising of Lazarus. All the gospels tell of times that Jesus goes away for an extended period of time to pray. Do you know what that says to me? That tells me that Jesus was on a need-to-know basis with the Father just like me and just like you. I think we mistakenly believe that Jesus walked around the earth and he had it all figured out. He knew all the answers. He knew everything that was going to happen before it ever happened. Jesus knew what God revealed to him, and he went to hear from the Lord in prayer, just like us. So now in Luke 6, upon realizing that powerful religious leaders were plotting and conspiring against him, 
Jesus does not go up to pray simply because he was told to. He goes in desperation to the Father and says, Father, powerful people are trying to kill me. What is your will? What is the next step? Where do I go from here? And somewhere over the course of that night, I believe that the Father responded to him and said, you need to prepare for the fact that you're not going to be here very long. You need to prepare a group of people who will carry on the gospel ministry. And over the course of that all-night prayer, the Father reveals to him who is to be chosen to be set apart for leadership. And so the text tells us that he comes back down from the mountain, he calls all of his disciples together, and then he appoints 12 to be apostles. And those 12, of course, are James, I'm sorry, Peter, Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, Simon, Judas, the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot. Now, what, what, what is the takeaway from this text this morning? I think there are, are several. And the first is, is surely the most important and one that probably could just be the end of the message. And that is this. If Jesus had to pray, so do we. I mean, if Jesus could not negotiate ministry, figure out how to overcome opposition, or determine who to select for leadership without spending an entire night in prayer, how come we think we can get by on five to six minutes, if that? You know, I just want to tell you, every Sunday, I preach to myself before I ever preach to you, and this is definitely preaching to me. I just read a survey the other day that 80% of pastors who are, have been polled uh, admit that they pray less than 15 minutes a day. And I'll tell you that, you know, upon reflection, there are days when I'd be hard pressed to top five. And that's very embarrassing for me to admit to you publicly, but the Lord has rebuked me on this, and over the past year, he has drawn me into a deeper seasons of prayer but it's still something as a very busy person, as a person who's fairly self-absorbed at times and, and uh, distracted by many things. Um, I find that, that sometimes I'm, I'm one of those 80%, and it kills me because I am learning that prayer is at the heart of knowing and obeying God. There is a quintessential difference, and I have truth tellers in my life who point this out to me. They said, Jim, it's very obvious for us to be able to tell when you've prayed about a decision or where you've just launched out and maybe haven't actually asked the Lord what his will is. And that's true for all of us, isn't it? There's a quintessential difference of knowing what the Father's will because you took the time to ask him versus just launching out doing what you think is the right thing to do, relying upon your intelligence and your competence. That's one of the reasons that the session felt so convicted to call you to 10 days of prayer. And not just prayer, but prayer like he showed us, prayer that goes through the night. There's so much power in that prayer. Those seasons of times of when the church has come together and prayed for 24 hours in a row for several days has led to very significant movements of the Holy Spirit in our church. And that's true, not just in our church, but it's true for you in your life, in the life of your family, in your circumstances. How can you go about being obedient to the will of God if you're not asking him what his will is? It is revealed in his word, but oftentimes God brings conviction, discernment, and gives us direction through prayer. And I am increasingly convinced that God waits. He waits to act, he waits to reveal his will, he waits to uh, adjust your circumstances until you take the time to ask him. Because it's in prayer that God then has that power to act and receive the glory. You see, all of our lives are established and, and, and set in such a way as to bring God glory. And we bring him glory when we pray before we act, when we pray before we uh, move forward. And again, I am rebuking myself. Uh, This is something that's hard for those of us who are kind of drivers. And so this is a very powerful reality. If Jesus had to pray, so do we. Notice also that Jesus prayed to God specifically about people to reveal who should take critical roles of leadership. This is very significant. You see, there's a difference in the New Testament between disciples and apostles. Disciples are those who are drawn to Christ. Apostles are those who are appointed by Christ. Disciples are students and followers, but apostles are given this 
authority to teach the true gospel and to exercise the power of the gospel through the authority of his name. Now, we no longer think of our leaders in the church as apostles, but there are still some similar dynamics when it comes to determining who will serve in leadership positions in the church. Leaders are chosen and appointed, and with that appointment comes a tremendous amount of responsibility and accountability. Now, it's very easy to misunderstand leadership all across the board, but certainly even within the church, as somehow being this esteemed higher than position, even perhaps an inner circle. And it's true if you look at the gospel that Jesus pours himself into the 12 as he is uh, equipping them to take the gospel ministry and advance it throughout the world. But it would be a mistake to think of the call to leadership as some kind of a glory trip because serving as an apostle would bring all of these men into harm's way. With the exception of Judas the betrayer, we believe that every one of the apostles was murdered for his faith. These men were not appointed for positional status. They were appointed to give their lives away for the sake of the gospel. When Jesus asked God that night on the mountain to reveal who should be chosen as leaders, I I think of that very similar to a general praying desperately to try to discern who he's going to send on a mission knowing very well they most likely will never return. And this is a proper metaphor on this July 4th weekend. Men and women in our country's history have been sent on missions that they never return from. Somebody sat up all night praying about who would go. That's the picture. You see, because even greater than liberty, eternity weighs in the balance. And I suspect that as Jesus called his disciples together that morning and he looked over those he would appoint as apostles, it choked him up a little bit because he knew that the world would come to know the gospel of Jesus Christ and the gospel of grace and the hope of salvation through these men, but it would cost them their lives. That's the picture. Christian leadership, though, you know, even today, it's still kind of like that. It's still a journey that requires perseverance. There's no glory, there's no status, there's no privilege in being appointed as a leader of the church. A Christian leader is one who serves and sacrifices in order that the gospel will be proclaimed and the kingdom advanced, whatever the cost. That's why we take the election of officers very seriously here at Colonial. Officers are chosen from amongst many disciples in this church. They are interviewed, scrutinized, and prayed over They are interviewed by our session. When new officers are elected to the congregation, we train them to anticipate what they can come to expect in Christian leadership. They can expect opposition and spiritual attack upon their lives personally and that of their families. Many times, unfortunately, it's been my experience throughout my 22 years of ministry, the attack comes in the form of a betrayal, a a, a betrayal very much like Judas. It comes from the inside. They can expect to feel inadequate most of the time. And in those moments when they feel competent and adequate to lead God's church, they're in trouble. And we all are, right? Because none of us are actually adequate in any way to lead God's church. All we can do is depend on him. They can expect to feel tempted like never before. Tempted to sin and tempted to quit. Sounds like a lot of fun, doesn't it? But see, there's something else they can expect. They can also expect to feel the pleasure of God when they pray to discern God's will and they lead the church to pursue God's will. Next week, we'll see Jesus, in in my opinion, kind of giving that similar talk to those who he's appointed into leadership as well as those who would follow him as disciples. Here's what you can expect. Now notice as well that the apostles are a very diverse group of people. We don't know a lot about all of the 12, but we know that some are fishermen, some are, uh, one at least is a tax collector, and, and there's a political activist in there. So at least this much information tells us that the qualifications for leadership in the first century church were not, you know, financial wherewithal, marketplace success, or some degree of power influence. Unfortunately, within the history of the church, oftentimes that's how leaders are chosen. 
I've served in churches where you didn't even qualify for consideration in leading the church if you did not fit in the top 50 givers. Very common throughout our Presbyterian culture, and I will say that I don't believe it's true here at Colonial, but I've seen it in other places. You know, uh, leaders are chosen based upon their success in the marketplace, as though somehow success in the marketplace would translate into success in the church. But that's not what we see here in Luke. We see Jesus praying about and choosing a very diverse group of people to serve in leadership. In fact, it would be difficult to trace any common denominator amongst this, these 12 men outside of their commitment to follow Jesus. That's it. In other words, the apostles were not superheroes. They were ordinary people who had a very deep faith in Christ. You know, when I think about our current session, our elders, we have 15 lay elders and then the pastors, I, I'm pleased with the diversity that I see there. Uh, there's certainly room for more diversity, but you know, we have some, some successful marketplace leaders. We also have stay-at-home moms who are brilliant. We also have many who don't rank highly in Forbes magazine or marketplace, but have tremendous gifts for leadership in the church. Our leaders are ordinary people, especially Steve Oliver. He's the most ordinary person I've ever known. Uh, there he is, standing next to me there. Don't ask me about that picture. All right, so... This morning, uh, in your bulletin, I'm gonna give you an opportunity to step right into the text here because we have a process that we kick off about this time every year of beginning to discern who will serve as the next group of leaders in our church. Our leaders serve three-year terms, so every year we lose a third of our leaders and they are replaced by a new group. And you play a role in that. In your time of prayer and discernment, within your sphere of influence, you begin to pray about who the Lord might set upon uh, your heart to identify as a potential leader. You nominate those people. They go to our nominating committee who begins to pray over that list and there's interview and scrutiny and all that, that that happens. Again, we take this process very seriously, but it begins with you. And so I ask you to pray about uh, who you might feel needs to be called to this very important task of, of living sacrificially for the sake of the gospel advancing as a leader uh, within our church and fill that out on that card. One last point I want you to consider. You know, we see this a lot in John 17, but it's, there's a glimpse of it right here as well, and that is that, that Jesus prays for us. He prays for people. He prays about people. He prays about very specific people, ordinary people, people with names, people with histories, people with warts, people who have all kinds of mixed motives. He prays about specific people by name and thinks about, is in conversation with the Father about what role they should play in the kingdom ministry while they have breath on this earth. That is a very significant point. Many of us think of God's sovereignty in such a way that God just does whatever he wants, whenever he wants, however he wants. That's not really consistent with the gospel. What we see is that God chooses to work through people with names, ordinary people, like you and like me. And I believe that I would be accurate in saying that who serves where and when in what capacity is just as important now as it was in the first century. We've been praying and thinking about this very concept within the leadership here at Colonial for some time. We are convinced, I am convinced, I believe the scripture says that each believer has been designed, gifted, and shaped in a specific way to serve, to advance the kingdom, to help us in the proclamation of the gospel. And yet, this is not a criticism, it is an observation. And yet, so many within our church culture do little more than attend services on a Sunday. That may be your fault, but it's probably mine to some degree and the leadership of the church because we have heard you say We've heard people throughout decades, as I understand it, say, it's just so hard to get plugged in. It's hard to find the place where I can serve, or I tried that and it burned me out, and I just don't think I wanna, I just don't think I wanna do anything more like that, right? And so we have been praying and thinking and strategizing, how can we best create a means and a system by which people can identify 
who they are and how they are and where their passions and experiences might be and then get them connected to the appropriate places where they can serve out of their strength, out of their passion, that they can leverage their life experience for the sake of doing ministry. When I say ministry, I'm not just talking about taking a role within the local church. I'm talking about ministry in the big picture. The local church, the city, even internationally. How can we get you to know who you are and understand those things the way God has shaped you and gifted you and then help you to get connected in the appropriate place where when you serve, you serve out of joy, you serve out of the overflow, you're doing the thing that you were made to do. Now, we have not exhausted the answer to that question, but we're ready to begin a new process and one that we hope will take strides towards getting you connected, if you're not already, into a place of serving out of your passion. There are two steps that I want you to consider. The first step is to fill out the little uh, blue card. I set it down someplace, here it is. You can see it up there. Uh, This blue card, it's gonna be around for a while. And what it does is it just helps us to get to know you and, and know a little bit about how you are, okay? We can't get you plugged in if we don't know you or we don't know anything about you. And so if you will fill out this card, just give us a sense of your passions, your abilities. If you've taken a spiritual gift assessment, what are your spiritual gifts? If you haven't taken that, you can pick one up on the information desk at both campuses. Now, this is a very simple tool, but what'll happen is with this information, we will update your profile on our church-wide database called Colonial Community Builder, or CCB. We've been talking about this now for several months, that you have a page and a profile you can update any time. But if you'll fill this out, we'll update it for you. Now what that will do is it will allow us to cross-reference what you've said about yourself with opportunities and ministry positions that come up that are identified by our staff, our leadership in any area, even within the city as those things are entered in and we get a sense of of what uh, fits the bill in these opportunities to serve. And when we can cross-reference those things, we can begin to generate invitations specifically to you based upon opportunities that meet your profile, okay? Now, that's a bit impersonal. Uh, It's just a, a card and a database and all those things. It's better than nothing. But step two is far more personal. It takes a little bit greater level of commitment than filling out a card. And that is to pray about entering into this Discover Your Design course. It's four weeks, and over the course of those four weeks, we'll help you explore your spiritual gifts, your passions, your personality, uh, as well as just to kind of get a sense of your experience. Then you will have a chance to kind of see how those things perhaps match up with different areas of ministry inside the church and outside the church. But the most important thing that I think comes out of this uh, class is a relationship with a coach, a ministry coach. These are brave individuals who have been trained and been willing to take uh, the initiative to partner with you and kind of walk beside you in this matchmaking process of, of you and an opportunity to serve that really energizes you, okay? And that matchmaking process may take a week, it, it may take six months, but this coach would be committed to walk beside you. If you get into an area that just doesn't fit, They'll help get you out and get you into another place, all right? So that's a, that's a very big deal for us. We've been working uh, hard on this. Um, I will say that it's taken a lot of time and energy uh, upon our staff and leadership to, to prepare this opportunity for you, and I just hope that you'll take advantage of it. Uh, and, and we owe a great deal of thanks to Jan Lucas and uh, Jay Childs who have really given a year of their life to get this thing up and running. So here's the ask. First, fill out the form. Let us know who you are and how you are a little bit so we can at least begin to cross-reference your name and abilities with opportunities and get that communication to you. And secondly, pray about taking the DYD course as it's offered, and we'll be offering this regularly, and uh, that will help you even further to get, uh, to get into a place that energizes you as you serve. Now, I know, I know as I speak to hundreds of people on a Sunday, that there's a portion of you out there who are kind of saying to yourself, actually, I kind of like just showing up on Sunday. (laughs) You know, it works for me. I'm I'm good with that. I'm not really looking to, uh, you know, get all that involved. I'm thinking I'm not going to turn in this card. I'm I'm happy with you not knowing who I am and how I am and 
sending me emails and telling me about opportunities to serve. Why, why, would, I, why would I do that? Okay, well, here's why. You see, according to Luke 6, Jesus is thinking about you by name. He is praying to the Father about how you will be leveraged to advance the kingdom and to proclaim the gospel. You see, the New Testament is very clear. You have been saved to serve. You have not been saved to sit around and wait for heaven. You have not been saved to generally do whatever you want to do, whenever you want to do it, and just kind of ignore the claim of the gospel upon your life, your time, and your resources. You see, he, you got to keep in mind the big picture, all right? You have never met a person who is not a spiritual being who will go on and live forever. Every person that you meet, every person ever born is a spiritual being who will go on and live forever. And the, the reality that they will live in, that is their eternal destiny, really is determined upon one central truth. It's called the gospel. People need to know that there is justice in this world, that breaking God's law, which is something that we all do, leads to a condemnation of our spiritual being, and that will be our reality forever, unless we understand that there was one named Jesus Christ who came and suffered the cross and rose again on the third day that our sins might be forgiven and that our relationship with God might be restored. That's serious business. And that is everybody's business. There is hope, there is salvation for those who confess their sins, repent and call upon the name of Jesus, the only one who saves. People don't know that unless they're told that. You see, so God invested in us, he saved us, that we would serve by making that message known to the entire world. If you defect from the place in your sphere of influence where God has called you to serve and bear witness to the truth of the gospel, there is a terrible consequence. There are those who will perish because we failed to step in and serve even when we we're saved. So I have to ask you, are you serving? Are you in any way bringing glory to God? Are you in any way revealing the light of the gospel? Are you in any way bearing witness to the truth that saves people from hell? Yes or no? Because if the answer is no, I just gave you an on-ramp to get started. But please don't think it's optional that you can call yourself a believer and call yourself as one who is saved and going to heaven and do nothing. I don't see it. In fact, I see exactly the opposite. I know that's heavy, but friends, you don't wanna miss this. This is what you were created to do. All of the pain, all of the experiences, all of the good things, all of your competency, all of your intelligence, all of your giftedness was not designed to make money. It was designed to give glory to God. Amen? So get in the game, do something, <laughs> and let us help you find that place that you were designed to serve, that, that place that's gonna bring you energy, and you'll just feel the light and the pleasure of God as you do that and bring glory to him and, and just advance the kingdom, make the gospel known. Will you pray with me? It's so humbling, Lord, to think that you would spend all night praying about ordinary people like us. That you would invest eternity into, into the lives of fallen individuals like me. And yet that is the way that you've chosen to work, that we might work in a relationship with you, in obedience to you, to be the means by which the world would come to know the one that saves. And Father, we repent for sitting it out. We repent for the ways that we have been so self-absorbed that we've forgotten our highest calling. You have given us gifts and competencies and intelligence. You've given us the ability to pray that we might make the gospel known and advance your kingdom in our lives.
in this place where we live, in our circle of influence, in our family. But we feel so inadequate and we feel so non-committal at times. Father, please stir within us a fire of conviction that this is why we were born, that we have breath to bring you glory and to reveal the hope of the gospel to the whole world. May we not rest until we find that place where we know that we are serving faithfully with energy in the place that you've gifted us to serve, no matter what the task might be, that we are cooperating toward the advancement of the kingdom in the church, in the city, in the world. In the name of Christ, I pray. Amen.